Good morning, everyone. So, <clears throat> substitution. Okay, uh, so daily reminder to schedule the oral part of your final exam, although no one no one here has to do that, I think. You've all done it. Okay. Um, so, um, let's go back to intervals. Okay, so yesterday, oh, let's start from before. So yesterday, we spent a lot of time integrating the tangent. And it wasn't that difficult in the end because, uh, well, one lesson was that you got to choose what you substitute carefully. Or you might not get the answer, or you might get it after a lot of work. Um, I guess, uh, but I guess also, I had to show you an example where things are not super easy either way. Um, okay, so what we're gonna do today is uh, substitution for definite integrals. So say we need to <clears throat> say we need to take this integral. So um, I have I have two methods for you. And you can choose whichever one you like. They will, they will both give you the same answer. Um, method number one is uh, solve the indefinite integral first. And after you're done, plug in the bounds and uh, and subtract. So um, this is the one that will. I think the most straightforward one. Uh, I've been spending two days on solving uh, indefinite integrals like this. And I know if I have the, the indefinite integral to get the definite one, I only need to plug in. So let's see how we can do that. So what substitution should I make here? to make this simpler. I mean, could you just turn it to like cosine squared of sine of x and then do you like u equals sine of u or something or like cosine squared this is not cosine squared of sine of x um this is so this is what you get when you um when you plug in sine of x so this means plug in sine of x into cosine I multiply by um, by cosine of x. So this is a product, and this is not a product.
so um for example so okay let's address that So for example, make um make make x equals pi, then the sine of pi you see me that that is the correct answer. Um the sine of pi is um well pi looks like this. And it's zero every pi. So if I do x equals pi, cosine of sine of pi, times cosine of pi is the same as cosine of zero times cosine of pi. Um, and this is cosine of zero is one, cosine of pi is negative one. And if I do cosine squared of sine of pi, it looks completely different. Um, then I'm doing cosine squared of, of zero. So even if you don't remember what cosine is at, at certain values, these are definitely, they don't look the same. This is one squared. Okay, so these are not the same. But I, I did stop. Um, I did stop to clarify that because I do see this a lot of times in the homework. Okay. Any questions about that? I know that clarifies it. So, just in case, um, let me graph them. They're just. Uh, they just look completely different. And I don't know what they look like, but I know there's no chance they look the same. Well, there's cosine uh, of sine times cosine. Let's see if it understands this. Yeah. Um, and that's cosine squared of sine of x. One is positive always um, because it's a square. <clears throat> okay. So um, I should do what Sydney said and make u equals sine I guess there's other things I could try, but this is going to be the good one because the derivative of sine is right there. So if you make u equal sine, du is supposed to be the derivative times dx. So du is going to be cosine x dx. And when doing a u substitution takes care of uh, of a whole chunk of your of of your original function, that's that's generally a good sign. Um, so, um, well, sine of x is u. So this is just going to be the integral of cosine u. Times du. Because the, the u came from originally having sine of x, and du came from having cosine of x dx. <clears throat> Wait, but wouldn't it be negative though? No, the derivative of sine is positive cosine. Well, no, because um, like 
whenever you did like the whole du thing, you need to have like negative cosine to get because like isn't like the derivative of sine negative cosine? No, it's positive. Oh, okay. Um. So. This is sine, and this is positive cosine here. Uh, well, no, that's a, oh yeah. Um, the slope is positive, and here cosine equals one. So that's how you can remember. Um, just from looking at one point, you can see it can't be negative cosine because negative cosine starts out negative so the slope is the derivative <clears throat> okay so now i'm down to taking the integral of cosine so what's the integral of cosine Uh, it's positive sign because the derivative of sine is positive cosine. But hypothetically, if this was like sine of u, it would be negative cosine like that. Yes. <laughs> okay. So the derivative of sine is, is, is positive cosine, derivative of cosine is negative sine. But if you are doing integrals, then they go the other way around, which is why this is hard to remember. And it's better to draw a picture. Um, if, you, if you draw this, if, I mean, you have to remember how to draw sine and cosine. Uh, but at some point you gotta learn that. Um, and if you remember that sine starts out increasing, its derivative has to be positive. On the other hand, cosine starts out decreasing, so its derivative has to start out negative. Okay, so um, I have, well, I there's no integral sign anymore there, so I'm, I'm really done taking the integral. I just need to undo the substitution I did at the beginning. I'm gonna get sine and then u is gonna become sine of x. So um, the, the answer for the indefinite integral is sine of sine of x. And this is by the way, not sine squared of x. Um, because this is doing sine and then doing sine again, which is not the same as multiplying. All right, so I have the indefinite integral. So if I want the definite integral, um, this is then very easy. Um, you just take this function, plug in one, plug in two, and subtract, which is what 
this bar or sometimes square brackets um, mean? Um, so the answer is sine of sine of two minus sine of sine of one. Um, I don't know, there's no nicer way to write sine of two or sine of one. So not really anything I can do to simplify that. So um, so that's the answer. That's how you do a definite integral. Um, oh, one thing. One thing I should have done is check um, that I did the indefinite integral correctly. So to do that, I just take the derivative of the answer. And I have to take the derivative of the outside times the inside uh, times the derivative of the inside. Which is um, the original function, so I'm, I'm good. Okay, so that's the problem. Any questions? You don't want us to subtract? I mean, I don't, I don't care. 0 0.003. I think that sounds like you're doing it in, in degrees and not in radians. Zero point zero four three four. Um, is this so? Um, oh yeah, that makes sense. Um, so, so this is the area. Um, So that looks like, um, well, like one half base, like one third height. So probably like one twelfth. Um, that's probably one twelfth. But then what we, then we also have um, the negative part. Um, and I'm subtracting that. So the integral So this is what I'm I just computed. Um the the integral from one to two of a function is the red area minus the blue area. Because remember that an integral adds the area on top of the axis and subtracts the area underneath the axis. So these two areas look pretty similar to me. Um, let's see, I'm gonna guess that this is, um, 0.5, say this is some sort of like a triangle and this one has base 0.5 and area 0.2. So the total area of 0 0.05 and this one has base 0.4 and height 0.25. So then the total area would be something like um, 
zero point zero five. I don't know another zero. I think it makes sense. Um, I don't know. I don't know how good I am at estimating areas, but I think it makes sense that the difference between this and that is a pretty small positive number. So I think uh, uh, 0 0.04 is probably is probably the right area. It's one twenty fifth of a of a square. But I don't. I mean. In this class, it's assumed you're capable of plugging in numbers into a calculator. That's kind of not the point anymore. OK, so that's method number one. So method number two of doing exactly the same thing. Um, is um, you do a substitution. Uh, for the definite integral and you and you change the bounds according to the substitution So this is what I mean. I'm going to do the same one. So um, I'm supposed to, I'm going to do the same one, and I'm going to do the same substitution. So I'm going to, it's still going to work the same. Um, so. I'm making u equals sine x, du is cosine x dx. But now I need to change the bounds. That means that I need to see what u is if x is 1 and what u is if x is 2. So, um, So according to this formula, what is u if x is 1? Zero point eighty four. Uh, sine of one. Yeah, zero point eighty four. Uh, I'm not gonna write the decimals. I'm just gonna go. I'm just gonna say sine of one. Um. So, if you plug in x equals one, you get that u is sine of one. And if you plug in x equals 2, you get sine of 2. So what you're supposed to do um, so I mean, I didn't do uh, a complicated thing here. Just plug in the value of x. The, the easy thing is to forget. Um, is change the bounds, and now um, this will become. Well, I'll do. I'll do the same substitution from before. Sine of x is u. This whole thing is du. So this becomes the integral of cosine u du.
So the advantage here is that, so a definite integral, uh, a definite integral is a number. I'm just looking for a number here. Um, and those two numbers are the same. So I'm never gonna have to undo the substitution again. I'm just gonna solve this new problem and forget about the old one. Um, so the integral of cosine is sine. And to do the definite integral, what I need to do is plug in the, the bounds I have. So you plug in, um, u equals sine of two, u equals sine of one. And of course you get the same answer we had before. So these really, I mean, really they're pretty similar. Um, I'm not discovering here two completely different methods for anything. Um, so, so I mean, this is this is a bit shorter. Um, but I mean, I personally like the other method better because uh, because I get confused playing in the bounds. I never know which way if I have to solve for u in terms of x or x in terms of u, and then uh, I get confused. Um, I think this is easier to make mistakes. Um, in the other method, um, with method one, you can take a derivative. of the indefinite integral to check that you did it right. So whenever I do an integral, I'm never that confident that I didn't make an algebra mistake along the way, especially with a sign or something like that. So I like to take the derivative at the end. Um, and if you do this, there's nothing to take the derivative of. So, um, I mean, what, what you do is up to you. It's not that like they're very different anyway. Um, but this is what it is. Any questions? I mean, sometimes you get to do two substitutions and then I guess the method number two gets shorter and shorter, but also the number of mistakes gets bigger and bigger. So. Oh, wait, uh, let's do another example. I try to do both methods anyway. So let's do the integral so it's root of x squared plus one between negative one and three. <clears throat> so let's do this integral. Um, So, um, I mean, one day in your near future, if you take Oxford next semester in your very near future, you'll know a bunch of things you can try to do integrals. Um, and you'll have, you'll have doubts. You won't know which one, which, which thing to use for each integral. Right now, the only tool we have is use substitution. So I guess we're going to use use substitution. Um, so, um, what should I make u here? 
this one's um this one's trickier x squared plus one uh that makes sense i think that's what we should try so then du is the derivative times dx so du is 2x dx. Um, so I don't have, um, I don't have x dx there. I do have x to the fifth dx. Um, I don't know if that's good enough. So the root of x squared plus one is root of u. That's pretty clear. Um, and now I'm left with x to the fifth dx. Um, so I have to write this in terms of u and du. I mean, whichever way I, I go about this, um, there's only, there's, there's only, one answer at the end. So, um, well, I mean, the, the surefire way to do this is say if, if du is 2x dx, then dx is 1 over 2x du. So, go and replace dx by one over two x du. And that will leave you with one half x to the fourth du. So, um, if u is x squared plus one, what is x to the fourth? And um, so you should always be able to do this by solving for x and then plug it in. Um, How did you get one half x to the fourth? I got one half x to the fourth because I had, um, well, I had the half here and I had five x's in the numerator and one x in the denominator. So, um, that that became maybe one more step. X to the fifth divided by x. And when you subtract when the divide powers of x, the exponents subtract. And I got x to the fourth. Does that make sense? Yeah. All right. So um, now I'm left with this one half x to the fourth. Uh, and I need to do something with it. Um, so, um, I mean, whenever you have, so you have something that is not obviously you, uh, you can always just take what it, whatever equation you wrote and then solve for x. And then, well, here you would take the fourth power. And maybe we don't need to solve for x completely to do it though. Because if u is x squared plus one, I can, I know that u minus one is x squared. So what is x to the fourth gonna be? How do I get x to the fourth from this equation? I 
I square both sides. Yeah, Matthew. Um, so it turns out what I get is u minus one squared. Um, so if I put this into here, here I have one half u minus one squared. Okay, so sure, put everything together. Um, this part uh, was just root of u, and the remaining part was uh, this other bit. So when I put it together, I have. Um, well, everything together multiplied. Okay. I guess no one has questions. Um, so I need to decide whether I'm going to change the bounds or not change them. I don't, I'm not going to change them. Uh, so I'm going to go with the first method I showed today. So what I'm going to do to remind myself that I didn't change the bounds is remember, remind myself that these are not the bounds for u, but the bounds for x, so that I, I'm not tempted to make u equals negative 1. Because that that won't work. Um, <clears throat> okay, so I think I'm gonna turn pages now. Now I have to find the integral of one half u minus one. Well, get rid of the one half. One half u minus one squared root at root u du. So what can I do with this? Plugging u, but I need to take the integral first. I need to find the antiderivative. I need to find a function whose derivative is um, is this whole thing. Okay, fair enough. I guess you're speaking for everyone because nobody uh, wants to say anything. How about how about I simplify? This function. Is there anything I can do to this to make it 
more integral. Is there anything I can do to this part? Factor. Well, it's already factored. Un unfactor. Defactor. Retrofactor. Um, so. Cool. I, I could put it all in a square root, but. I don't know how to. I don't know how to deal with this anymore. Um, I don't think that makes it better for taking the integral. Okay, um, but you know, using the binomial formula. I can expand this product. And if I, well, if I have a root of u multiplying everything, I can also expand that part. And now it looks like something Gosh, it was negative one. Now it looks like something I can take the integral off. Did you distribute that square root of u to everything? Yeah, it's funny. Yeah. So that's um, so this is what I need to do now. Maybe it looks more doable if I write every all the roots as powers. So u squared times u to the one half. Well, it's u to the five halves. Um, u root u is root of the one half plus one, so u to the three halves. And the last term is u to the one half. So what's the antiderivative of this? So I have a bunch of powers of u added together and with some numbers multiplied. Um, so I could just use the power rule for that. If I don't forget the one half, um, the power rule says add a one to the exponent because I'm going backwards and divide by that exponent. So do that for all three terms um, and you will get the answer. So five halves plus one is seven halves. Three halves plus one is five halves. Um, so I guess if it's in the denominator, it becomes two sevenths.
this one becomes, well, there's already a two there, and it becomes two fifths. Um, and the last one becomes two thirds. And I guess is one half I could distribute as well. Anyway, um, that's the integral. Maybe maybe I'll distribute the one half because why why keep it there so that it becomes one seventh u to the seven halves minus two fifths u to the five halves plus one third u to the three halves. So um, okay, so this was this is the indefinite integral, but I'm taking a definite integral, so I need to plug in the bounds. Um, but before before I can plug in x, I need to write this in terms of x. So I need to undo the change that I did, which was make u equals to x squared plus one. So there's nothing to that, it's just writing. Every time I write I see a u, I write x squared plus one in brackets. And now I need to plug in negative one and three. Oof. Okay, so, um, I mean, I don't need to simplify this. I just need to plug it in. Um, but that's it. Um, so you make, um, X equals three, you get one seven. I guess X squared plus one is uh, 10. So it's seven halves minus two fifths, 10 to the five halves plus 10 to the three halves. And when you plug in negative one, X squared plus one becomes two. Um, So that's the answer, whatever it is, doesn't matter. The point is knowing how to do it. Who cares about the answer? Okay, um, any more questions? Okay, so, I mean, as you can see this, this gets tedious very fast. Um, but the thing is, you know, you're patient and organized. Um, there's a clear way to get to the end. The, the only problem is, the, the biggest problem is finding what substitution to make. Well, here I had to decide to simplify it too. I plugged in 10 because I, I was supposed to make x equals three. If I make x, x equals three, x squared plus one is 10. And if I make x equals negative one, x squared plus one is two. And I couldn't fit three squared plus one every time. So wherever there was an x squared plus one, I get 10. 